The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Thank you again, everybody, and uh, to the committee of the BSV for inviting me to come once again to share some thoughts, some Dhamma perspectives, and usually I speak to especially um, as we have seen in this recent times to important issues. Um, firstly, I would like to offer the merits of our chanting and this talk to all those who have suffered very greatly. If we just have a, a couple of moments to reflect with thought and in a meditative mind, we share our heartfelt condolences with those who have had great loss and great suffering. So many are uh, with very severe injuries, the parents, the siblings, the families, the congregations, and the society of Sri Lanka, and Sri Lankans throughout the world, along with their communities and friends. We sit with our hearts open and our thoughts with you today. Although we have a different faith, perhaps, this occasion, not only those sitting in church on what for Christians is perhaps one of their most special days, if not their most special day, the day of resurrection of Christ, Easter Sunday. But at the same time, people from so many countries in the world were in hotels, visiting as tourists, as dip diplomats, as relatives, and so many of these people also perished. They were from all sorts of faith. Perhaps of no faith. But all were human beings. All are our brother and sisters in this human world. And we can feel their trauma and the sadness that they are experiencing now. and may continue for some time. So with our hearts full of kind, loving kindness and kind thoughts, let us bring to mind the depth of this teaching. Love is always going to overcome hatred in loving kindness meditation it expands it connects
it penetrates what is ignorant and what separates. Loving kindness is the most powerful meditation. for us to experience what it is to be fully human. And so with this heart full of love and kindness, we extend that out to those who are suffering today. And we share this compassion and this wisdom also to those who have caused this suffering. Might alleviate the ignorance. In the hearts of those who may have future intent. So today I want to speak to this. I want to speak to this. these causes of hatred, these causes of anger that we all have. I've spoken on this many a time, but in the connection to what is in our own minds, our own hearts, is not so far away from a Zen perspective. We are that terror. are the child who has suffered a death. And those who feel for whatever circumstances, when we think about it, terrorism comes out of a history, a story a belief perhaps on some level, but there is usually behind it at some level a sense of inequality, a sense of not being heard. And from that a seed grows in the minds of some and in us, where that seed develops roots and grows an ideology. It will take some very profound teachings and remove a word or a sentence here and, here and there and it will expand and grow an ideology of separation, of us and them, of me and mine, and yours and that. Whatever that ideology is, it grows and it infests. And we have seen it here in Australia. I, do, I, I don't think there's anywhere in any culture and country in this world that has not suffered from the hands of extremism. in the history of humanity. And the Buddha always spoke to us that it is love that overcomes hatred. It cannot be hatred and violence overcoming hatred and violence. It cannot be anger to overcome anger. 
it is only the acts, sorry, acts <laughs> and intentions of virtuous actions, virtuous speech, virtuous thoughts that will penetrate and sever this ignorance. So powerful, the power of loving kindness, we cannot think about lightly. And yet, those people sitting in church with their loving kind thoughts, still many of them met their death at that moment. Personally, I wouldn't mind to be sitting here if that is my last moment in a meditative place, in a blessed place, but the terror it brings, the fear it brings to those in the congregation and beyond. It's very interesting, I read a, just a few words by, um, in an article by a, a terrorist reporter and he was he said he has seen so many acts of violence, so much death, but this really brought him to tears because he could not see the sense of it. It didn't make sense to him <coughs> at that time. And I think this is very interesting. It takes a long time for us to gra grapple around what has happened. You know, he said the, the elders of all over the country, old men coming in and crying their hearts out from all traditions as they streamed in to pay their respects. That human grief is there when loss becomes very present. We don't think because you're a Christian or you're a Muslim, you're a Buddhist, it's a human who has suffered here. If it was in a Catholic church here, we would be going to offer our respects and it is only very recently a number of us from our congregation here went to visit uh, an Islamic temple after they had their trauma, their tragedy in, in Christchurch. And there were hundreds of posies of flowers offered by local people from all faith, all backgrounds because we feel it so deeply. Alan Sanake, who I've mentioned once before, who is a wonderful Buddhist teacher, and he works in this, he goes all over the world to help in, in the suffering of others. He says, regardless of who is held responsible for these atrocities, our concern is based on compassion for all. Those lives have been torn apart by these acts of extreme violence and by our unshakable opposition to all forms of hatred, murder and terror. Our nonviolent stand does not arise from any one religious tradition, but from a universal awareness that life is so precious. As Western Buddhist practitioners, teachers and clergy, we depend on the Buddhist ancient teachings of nonviolence and love, even in this time of fear and uncertainty. That is, last paragraph is so important. We need our faith, we need our traditions, we need our understanding. So when it comes 
And at some point in life it does come. That we have to face our immortality, our human vulnerability, our losses within our family or in our body. At some point we have to face this with an integral mind an open, kind mind that can only grow through the depth of our personal inquiry, our personal practice and our faith, our traditions, our teachers help us do this. I know it helped me in the bushfires and in other times when I've lived, been in crises. Many years ago, in 1980 when I was in Korea, there was a, a terror of a different kind. You know, terrorism comes in different forms. You know, there is a small group that, such as we've seen in this case, that can bring upon, you know, a society or a few individuals, some great suffering. But there is the other where a government, a policy or a government, can inflict a lot of suffering, as we see with the Rohingya in Burma. But in Korea in 1980, there was a, a stamp down on student revolution. I was there, not in the revolution, not in the, the, the marching per se, but I happened to be cornered in Seoul. We'd been watching it going on for some months and it was growing in momentum. And uh, we had finished our three month retreat and we went to Seoul to replenish a few things that we needed to get to go back into retreat again. And um, myself and another nun, we had been invited out for a meal and had our meal and were coming back to the little temple we were staying in, we couldn't get back. All the, the streams of students coming through the city were barricaded. And the, the police wore, you know, big vests as if they're going to face a an army with spears, big vests and big shields and they just lined the roads like a big wall and we were trying to get out. And I saw a little wall and I said to Jai Gwangsanim, I said, let's jump over here. <laughs> and we had to climb several walls and back streets to get back to our temple. And you know, of course, as we're doing that, out come the tear gas and students racing and stones and whatever people were throwing at one another. And this sort of, this demonstration grew in Korea. We got out of Seoul, we got the bus out of Seoul and we went to Kwangju to finish our shopping and there we saw it again. But this time it had an eerie, you could feel something wasn't right. It was the same feeling I had in the bushfires. There's a stillness and in the air, you know, get out. And so we didn't do our shopping. As soon as we saw all the streams of students, we got a bus, the last bus out of Kwangju. One nun actually had to walk out because there was no bus and get it out in the, the far suburbs. And that night, the government parachuted in the army and they killed anything and everyone on the streets. It was downplayed in media, media, little media got out, but we actually had um, a, a, a journalist, happened to be there, Western journalist, and he came and stayed at our temple and he was developing photos that he'd taken. I mean, 
very horrific stuff because this was just pure directed combat individual and um, and for a long time we reflected on what would make those army personnel kill their brothers and sisters of the same culture and I realized it took a long many years before I came to know that they were actually drugged they had been starved so they were indoctrinated in a way that would make them do very heinous things and this is what happens in our culture in our society and it can happen in our minds it can happen in your children's minds because often it's youth who are very you know malleable in the way they live and think and we need to be aware of it we need to hold it for what it is all facets of it we need to be with that which is very painful can you imagine somebody you know very close to you a bright young student becoming radicalized you may not notice it, it can happen over quite a long time before a parent would even notice something's changed and then often it is not reported the behaviors aren't reported, they know there is a group gathering and slowly parents normalize it societies normalize it and the interesting thing in, in Sri Lanka it was the factionalization of the government that prevented all the warnings that came from overseas. There was a factionalization, the president's camp, the prime minister's camp, one not talking to the other. India had sent warnings, America had sent warnings. They had given names, they had given the places where it would happen. It happened in our bushfires. You know, two o'clock. At two o'clock in Diamond Creek, they knew a fire would be in King Lake before six o'clock. No warning. You, it's hard to fathom. How can you not send a message up the mountain? How can you not send a message to those churches? Maybe scan the bags that come through. It is because we become a little numb to it, a little unable to engage. When we sit in meditation and something comes up for us, something deeply troubling, it's not just the pain, but there's deep emotions behind it. What happens? We often turn away and try to entertain our mind. We change the meditation subject. We get up. We turn away. But I'm asking that we try. When we feel this, when we read the news or hear of an, a tragedy, not to turn away, but to embrace it with loving kindness. to be with it, find a way to listen to it, to try and understand it. The complex reasons for these extremes and the networks of extremes are something that the world has always had to deal with, societies have always had to deal with. At some point, various societies have collapsed because of 
whatever extremity has happened. But we're noticing there is an increase in violence in this last, in our society, particularly in this last 30, 40 years, and perhaps more so in this last 5, 10 years, and there's many factors for that. We can't just say because it's become a multicultural society. We can't just blame ideologies, religions. We can't just blame governments. Though some governments don't help. And we've seen that, you know. I've often wondered if we'd never gone to... Um, what was the... Kuwait? No. Not the, the war before Iraq. The big... And not Kuwait. What was there? Kuwait? Was it? Yeah, in Kuwait. We'd never gone into Kuwait. I've often wondered where we would be now. Because you can see where that seeded. From Haddam Hussein to Bin Laden to the ISIS movements to the... But a lot of these are the cover-up, the, the excuse for many localised current issues that are not being met. Why do our children end up in drugs? Because many of their social and problematic issues from a young child have not been properly addressed. Their psychological issues, their ADDH or whatever the AD, I think they've got an A to Z now of them. <laughs> They're not being addressed. In America now, the, the opioid issue is so great that the middle class, they say, are dropping like flies. Opioids are a whole range of amphetamines, but they start where people have an accident, have a trauma in their body, and the doctors prescribe heavy painkillers. And after the doctor says no more painkillers, they turn to other means to overcome their pain. Thank goodness we have people who are turning to meditation, to mindfulness practices. This is why mindfulness movement has grown, to help people deal with these physical and very traumatic inner disturbances. But because many of our drugs now are synthetic, then we are having an issue, a terror, a different terror, you might say, on what young people are consuming, what we are consuming. So terror is not something that is just an out there radicalized movement. It is something that is growing within us from quite a young age. Sometimes, as I said, we grow up and it's normalized. If everybody around us are thinking in a, in a particular religious, fanatical way, we are very likely to grow up and be a part of that. Just as people grow up within their culture and their traditions. But if that culture and tradition is seeded in a way, and we can see this in Sri Lanka from time to time, where radical Buddhists have done very extreme things. You know, they at first thought, is this an act of Buddhist against the Catholic? Or the <laughs> but even in going back to the situation in Korea with the the student, students revolting in 1971 in Sri Lanka. 15, 20,000 students died as they were radicalized into the view that communism was of value in that culture. 
This has happened in many places. So sometimes it's born into, into um, into a place, into a time, into the way, you know, a young youth are connecting and the movements around youth and their entertainment and their interests are growing. These cultures can do both extraordinarily wonderful things to make us look in, inward and make us um, clarify all these uh, distinctions and unuseful states of mind. But they can also do very harmful things. If we all think in our life, where and at what stage was it that I had lost my way? That I was confused? That I was being uh, led by others and unsure? It often goes back to when we are quite young, when we are youth. And it is also, uh, you know, from a Zen point of view, um, when there are gaps arising in our life, we have the saying that, you know, even one in the Xi Xing Ming, the, the great poem um, of just mind, it is talking about even to have one hair of a thought that's out of alignment with truth, then heaven and hell are set infinitely apart. Can you imagine well, one tiny little illusion that can arise in the mind that we can go multiple ways, this way, this way, this way, or this way. And when you're blind and the road is dark and you don't know where you're going, those different places can take you anywhere. So with our practice, we start to gather these complex states of our mind and who we are on a path, a steadfast path, that we know when we're walking this, it is guided by others who walked before us, the Buddha who walked before us and showed it to us or the great teachers of the traditions and the Zen masters in my tradition, it has guided us in a way that we don't make those extreme behaviours grow. We, they see, they come up. We see something in a moment. You know, when we watch a movie and we see a fight, you know, as a child, you watch, you see tiny little two-year-olds, you know, and they pick up something and they're suddenly a swordsman or whatever, you know. We used to have guns, as, toy guns as kids. You know, you're suddenly the fighter and one has to fight and one has to die, you know, as children play. But we watch something and if we're not watching it and aware of what it is we're watching, it's becoming a part of us in that moment. It's seeding our consciousness in that moment. Mostly, as soon as we sit for a little while in meditation, it just floats away. Most of us have enough of our consciousness, our awareness, our attention on this path that we are protected by the Dhamma. But when you're starting out, and you're feeding your mind with illusions or with drugs or with excitement and in the moment new experiences. You don't know what a path is. You don't know how to walk, how to eat, 
how to sleep even. We can always tell, you know, sleep is a big thing. If we don't have a good sleep, we don't wake up very happy. But it's because of what we feed in through these senses. And then what we do with it, with our thoughts. As I mentioned, you know, the, the, there are three types of reasons for terrorism. I actually put one to fourth. The third one is, I said the first is by small groups, the second by governments. The third one is carried out by larger groups. Now, even though there's, uh, what, a dozen people, maybe 60 people or so who are part of this organisation in Sri Lanka, a dozen people who perpetrated the acts, behind that there's a very large network of belief that's been shared through media. We don't know how large, but we know it's large. And, uh, and this becomes, when, when you get this third level and we have now have the technology online and people so willing to be people weak people or vulnerable people so willing to be a, a suicide shield then we do not know how it is going to come next someone wakes up on a bad day and does something stupid but one of the things we do know in this case, these people were young and well-educated and reasonably wealthy. Some of them were very wealthy. And what puzzled me about it was how a wealthy young man who's educated abroad, who travels a lot, can, with a family of several children, one on the way, can still act and his wife take further action to kill the family. That belief in something so much more magnificent post-death, that illusion that if we do this we gain so much more, that sort of ignorance. I mean, we do practices Many Buddhists do practices in the hope to go to, to Shita heaven or to a heaven. <laughs> but we don't do it on the back of violence, you know. We do it out of a steady progress of practice that illumines the mind that we can actually experience those very subtle, subtle states, such as heavenly realms, deva realms, but for a person who is an ordinary human being to develop these distorted beliefs, I think this is growing, sadly. And how to conquer it. How to get beyond the... Um, penetrate the mind of such people. Of course, they often stay in quite close circles and, uh, you know, um, yeah. But one of the things we can do is becoming more awake and more aware ourselves and more present and more open to have that mind to really listen to our friends, to acknowledge people's suffering. Rather than having to always give out advice, often it is a matter of being present with. I have a few people who like to give me a lot of advice. <laughs> a committee full. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to be present with, because <laughs> if I argue with them all, I'll be very, very tired. So I tend to go along and listen. 
And you know, they, everyone says what they want to say and then they carry on with their lives. Most of the time, you don't have to do anything except be with it. But to be with it with kindness, to be with it with heart, to be with it with generosity and openness, that gives the capacity for change. I mean, that all has to come from within ourselves. But to nourish through our practice those qualities, it is only through that developing within us that we can share it. Of course, for young people, this is not so easy. Actually, in another depth of Buddhism and Zen, everything is still wisdom, is still prajna. This is not so easy to see or experience, but we go out into the rain or the sunshine. If we're experiencing that fully in that moment, wisdom is present. We're not separated from that rain or that sunshine. That experience is not out there. It is here. And when we're experiencing trauma, terror, hatred, as the Buddha did on many occasions, wisdom was there. He didn't separate from it. He didn't make anything more of it. It was just that. And, and this is, even though it might sound as if we're diminishing the situation, we're not. We are accepting that that is what has happened. That is the reality of those causes and conditions. And in the light of that, and that uh, reporter discovered this, just being with all that trauma that surrounded you know, the decomposing bodies and the community that were paying their last respects and the pain that was happening, it brought great tears, but it also allowed him to be fully connected to that and to do the job he has to do, which is to report and understand it. And so we often think that loss is something that diminishes us. Loss is something that defines us. But it's not. Other than the ignorance, of course. And ignorance doesn't diminish us. Loss is part of what it is we have become attached to. That we identify as mine. That we hold on and grasp and cling to. Of course we do it. Of course we have families we love and we're attached to. But we need to be aware that with that comes a time of cessation, of ending of passing and of loss and grief. It may happen at the hands of terror. I hope in your life it doesn't ever. I've touched on it in my life a few times and it does embed um, and mark the mind brings weight and it brings
purpose to, but it brings weight and it brings deep in questions. So I hope it does not happen. But one thing to know, those moments of death, and I've talked about this more in more depth, have great pause. They have great space. And they have great acknowledgement and acceptance. I was talking to um, a friend who said, Tara, who comes here sometimes, she said, we asked her the other day, now when you had that, it was like an aneurysm, but not in the mind, in somewhere else. Um, when you had that near-death experience and it took her into a coma, she only lived because it happened, she was having a meal with people who were medical people, friends, and they knew what to do. She, she said when she came out of that coma, because nobody thought she would get through, when she came out she felt incredibly peaceful that the experience had actually been deeply peaceful. And she wondered why everybody looked so frantic, so worried, so busy, so confused, so frightened. Because she said, actually death, coming to the door of death is very peaceful. Because in that relinquishing, that letting go, those final moments, what, however long we've lived, a few months, a few years, a hundred years, I'm not sure even time matters, but life lived has been very precious. Life lived, if we can just instill that into the minds of people who think it is necessary to take another. Well, this is not working very well. Here we go. Um, just a couple of things to sort of round off. We're getting up to that time. Um, yeah, so how not to take it in. Sorry, how not to reject. And at the same time, how not to mark or hurt yourself. You know, that you see the poise of the stillness of teachers. They're both present, but they don't have to own and take in and make it mine. And at the same time, they don't have to reject. They don't have to make any more of it than what it is. They don't have to bring more suffering on suffering. Every time we relive a story, as you might be in your minds now, especially those of you who may have known someone or have been to those places, your mind relives it. In that moment, only in that moment, it is really alive. It is really happening. And you are really there. It's not when you were there physically before. It's only in that mind, in that place, in that moment that you are there. So in every great tragedy, there is also a great unfolding of truth, which I touched on with the prajna. There's life and even in a normality of life, there are situations that frighten us, terrify us. I mean, I'm a terror to my wallabies. When I come out and shoo them away out of my garden, I'm the terror. I'm a terror to an ant or to a spider because they're very conscious and very aware I might, you know, move in a way that's going to bring harm. So they scuttle away, except I had a little spider. He was, I was putting this together last night. He was very curious. He stayed around three hours, came close to my foot, then he went away and then came a bit closer. <laughs> Is she going to stomp on me? <laughs> What's she going? To? I'm the terror. 
in these times. We don't think of that very often, but just in this human form, we terrify a lot of beings. I remember um, a lady, going back to Tara's story, another lady, an Aboriginal woman once told me she drowned, nearly drowned, well she did drown, actually she drowned and came back to life. But for her it was a long time underwater. For the people who took her out of the water, she was a child, it was, you know, a couple of minutes. But she said in drowning, in her mind, she just went into that water element and it was full of so much life and so many beings. And in a moment, she had connected to them, in those few moments of her drowning. It was so visual, visual for her. And she didn't want to come out. When she was dragged out, she came out crying because she wanted to be down there, <laughs> dying in that, con in that situation. So death doesn't have to be frightening. And it's very possible it will not be. More than likely. I have no fear of death. Because the two, three times that I've come close, I've been very peaceful. Very still, very sound of mind, very clear. And um, just to finish here, there is a saying, a Zen um, koan. The world is so vast and wide. Why do you put on your robe? It's something we, we have to contemplate, you know, when we do the study these koans. When there is such a vast array of people and culture and thinking, why do we have to make ourselves this? And so I'm asking you to think about this, not regarding this robe, but why do we have to make our self something different, something special? What is it we call ourselves a Buddhist? What does that mean? Or Australian, what does that mean? Or Sri Lankan, if you go back in the history, you know, you've got all sorts of <laughs> story there. And when we do that, we can actually, in this state of mind, embrace and open ourselves to our brothers and sisters and our children, even though it's their children, it's our children. Even to the terrorist, even to the delusion, we can open ourselves and be with that. Be fully with that. And it will reveal so much about who we are, we really are. Because Qigong isn't this robe. This is something that has supported me on the path. Helped me live a more virtuous life. But it's not who I am. I'm so much more. You are so much more. And the lives of those who've passed away are so much more also. And will continue to be. So to this I offer any merit that we have made here today by sharing these thoughts, these teachings. And our loving kindness we share with all of those who have greatly suffered, who have had great loss.
and who will continue for some time. May they find the peace, the equanimity, the depth that their spiritual traditions and their path can lead them to.